Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. While the world came out strongly in support of Israel after the Hamas attack on October 7, there is now also growing concern over the images emerging from Gaza and the rising civilian death toll there. So as the war progresses, will the position of leaders, including Anthony Albanese, shift? Today, Radio National Breakfast presenter and co-host of the Party Room podcast, Patricia Carvelis, on the tightrope politicians are walking. PK, I want to start with the interview you conducted with Tony Burke on your program last week because it caused a bit of a stir. Tony Burke is the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations and he's my guest this morning. Minister, welcome back to the program. Good morning, Patricia. Let's unpack first what he was actually saying, what you were talking to him about. So he came on my show to talk about industrial relations. That's what he came on the show to talk about. And we did that. We Mm -hmm. talked about silicosis and other issues. But he's also a senior cabinet minister that represents a seat which is incredibly multiculturally diverse and has a high number of Arab Australians and Muslim Australians. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we talked about the war because the Albanese government's positioning on this war has become a really important talking point. Mm -hmm. He made a number of comments which became quite controversial I'll tell you about a couple of them. He, for instance, backed a Sydney Council's decision to raise the Palestinian flag until a ceasefire is declared in the Israeli-Gaza conflict. In my part of Sydney, people are watching every day death. Often the images they're seeing turn out to be of people they know. And until the Council made that decision, there was nowhere in Australia where those colours were being acknowledged as worthy of grieving. He said people had the right to grieve what they saw happening to Palestinians and even went further, actually, and said if people wanted to raise Palestinian flags across the country, there's no reason they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. He made the very important and accurate point that it's not a Hamas flag, it's a Palestinian flag. It is not the Hamas flag that's flying, it's the Palestinian flag. And it's a flag that gives people the chance to know that there is recognition and not selective grief. He talked about the fact that at the moment he thinks something is going on, which is that there is a kind of competitive grief. He said people Mm. should be allowed in Australia to mourn for the dead, whether they be Palestinians or Israeli. It was widely, I think, interpreted as sort of stepping out and being uh, really pushing as much as he could because he still said he supported the government's position. So he didn't necessarily break ranks with the government. Mm. But it's fair to say if you study the emphasis of what he was saying, it was quite different to some of the other things we've heard. Yeah. And then, of course, PK, you asked a question that angered some people. I did. Mm -hmm. I asked asked, and thank you for saying I asked a question because that's exactly what I did. It was a question, not a statement. It's been wrongly reported as a statement. It wasn't. It was a question where I noted that some people in the discussion, um, and in fact, even at the UN level, have talked about this being a potential genocide, What what's happening in Gaza, and did he agree? I've uh, heard people describe it as a genocide. Do you see it that way? I prefer to provide the facts as I just did, and I think your listeners will will find their own words to be able to describe it. I, I think when now, he we... said that wasn't the word he'd use. Uh, he didn't denounce the word either, which was jumped all over by some, and that's that people's right to scrutinise what the minister has said, but certainly I didn't use the word, and, and my job is to ask questions and what I was trying to do here, and I think was a pretty important interview actually, was to try and find out where this senior cabinet minister that represents many Arab and Muslim Australians sits on this issue, how that aligns with government policy, 
how far he was pushing that line between his own view and government policy. That's mm. that's what I was trying to do as an interviewer, which I think I did pretty well, actually. Yeah, exactly. All right. And you also, of course, spoke to the industry minister, Ed Husick, before you spoke to Tony Burke. He's a Muslim. He was, in fact, the first to... I don't want to use the term break ranks because I think it's too strong a term, but certainly to differentiate or to put different emphasis on the government's position on this war. So Ed Husick did use the term collective punishment, which is considered a war crime. He didn't call it a war crime per se, but that's what the term collective punishment means. Um, Mm. It's no surprise that there are some saying that this is the collective punishment being extended to Palestinians. And do you see it as collective punishment? I feel very strongly that uh, Palestinians are being collectively punished here for Hamas's barbarism. He was referring to the fact that many Palestinians were losing their lives, which is well known. We know that there are thousands of children dying in this war and that he believes that, that this is devastating for the community and he wants to speak out on that. Now, Anne Ali is another minister. She's a more junior minister. She's not in Cabinet. She's an early childhood education minister. She happens also uh, to be Muslim. She also said it was difficult to argue that Palestinians weren't being collectively punished as well when it was put to her. Well, you know, you've got over 3,000 people have died in Palestine, have been killed in Palestine in just two weeks. Over 1,000 of them are children. It's difficult to argue that those children are Hamas. And it's difficult to argue that what is currently occurring is not a form of collective punishment. The The Labor backbencher, Maria Van Vakenu, urged the federal government to call on Israel to back down from its planned ground invasion. So there are many voices in the government which have been raising concerns about the way that Israel responds. Not all of them have called for a ceasefire. I mean, Tony Burke spoke to me. He didn't call for a ceasefire, but the government's Mm -hmm. position at the moment is to call for a humanitarian pause to get more aid in, but they haven't called for a ceasefire. Yeah, right, because the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and the Foreign Minister Penny Wong are very deliberate in their wording. Uh, We say that Israel has a right to defend itself, but how it defends itself matters. And we want to see all innocent lives protected. Uh, So we today joined with other members of the international community in uh, calling for uh, pauses in conflict to enable humanitarian aid to get into civilians. Tony Burke's comments, Ed Husick's comments and others, of course the opposition has jumped on those saying... It shows that there's deep division and confusion within the Labor Party on this matter. So the Deputy Opposition Leader, Susan Lee, for instance, called on Anthony Albanese to clear up confusion and explain whether he agrees with his Cabinet Minister Ed Husick or not. Uh, Peter Dutton was very, very uh, critical of Tony Burke, said that Tony Burke should be given a dressing down. So on your question, is there a big split in the government? There is absolutely, and I'm going to use a different word, there's a schism Mm. and there are uh, positions of emphasis which are different in the government and that's always uncomfortable in any government when it's at a cabinet level. There's no doubt about it. There's There's no shying away from that. So, But is it a huge split? I don't think so at this stage because Mm -hmm. it is not inconsistent with Penny Wong's general comments around this conflict, but it's a tightrope they're walking, right, Sam? It is a narrow, narrow pathway they're walking. They are supporting Israel and its right to defend itself, but they're equally saying that civilian deaths must be kept to a minimum. Mm -hmm. And then the question must arise, is what we're seeing unfold a minimum? the public reaction is really key because if you look at the protests on the streets, I think there is a strong sentiment in the public and in the community 
that the death toll is is excessive. Occupation is a crime. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Many children dying, we know that, and that's where it's a difficulty for the government. Many people in the community, and I'm not making my own judgment on this because that's not my role, but many people are saying it's not proportionate and that's an issue for the government because they represent many, many people who are very angry about this issue. And so that's politically difficult for them as well. Just remind me, PK, what is the position of the federal opposition? You also spoke with its foreign affairs spokesman, Simon Birmingham. Both the the government and the opposition support Israel's right to defend itself. The difference, as far as I can see it, is in emphasis again and in the strength of the comments. So Simon Birmingham says that Israel is fully entitled to wage a war against Hamas to stop them from repeating terrorist atrocities in Israel. Now, the government agrees with that too. Now, Mm. I asked Simon Birmingham, the shadow minister, about the statistic of 1,000 children being killed each week in this crisis, in this war in Gaza, and whether that's acceptable. And that's the reckoning. He wouldn't cast any judgment on Israel's actions. Uh, He simply says it's a tragedy to lose children, which he did say. But on that central question about where is the line and when does it get crossed, he won't go there. I would dearly wish to not see uh, any child uh, face uh, the loss of their life in war-torn situations. But there is also the reality that the loss of innocent lives does occur in wars. Uh, How those wars are fought is important. Uh, And, of course, in this case, why the war is being fought should not be forgotten by anybody in terms of... And so on it... On the issue of nuance, and I know people don't always love nuance, there is a there is a difference in the positions between, I think, the government and the opposition, although they do have similarities as well. Yeah. And as you mentioned, there are growing pro-Palestinian protests around Australia calling for a ceasefire. But there's also, you know, a strong Jewish community and lobby in Australia. So politically, how does this sit for the Albanese government? As you said, it's a a tightrope. It's tricky, isn't it? But can it sway support for or against the government, do you think? I actually think this is a really big issue potentially for the Albanese government. They are in what is really a wicked position when it comes to positioning on all of this. They want to remain a friend of Israel and defend Israel and its right to defend itself from what were barbaric, horrific, unconscionable acts of violence against Israeli people. And that's what happened. But increasingly in the Arab world and in the Arab communities that Labor MPs overwhelmingly represent, Mm -hmm. right, that is, that's a big voter base for some of them, up to 30% in some electorates. Some of those people are red hot with rage that they feel that their government has not talked about their loss of life or their homeland. And that is becoming a problem for the Albanese government. I know it because they've told me. It's becoming a big problem for them. What they are now going to reckon with is a public that might grow pretty frustrated with uh, a steadfast commitment to Israel's right to defend itself when the public might think, hang on a minute, this is going too far. And that becomes a political problem for the government. Patricia Carvelis is the host of Radio National Breakfast and co-host of the Party Room podcast. This episode was produced by Lara Corrigan, Bridget Fitzgerald, Nell Whitehead, Anna John and Sam Dunn, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is David Cody. Over the weekend, catch the latest season of the ABC podcast, Expanse, bringing you one of the greatest sea survival stories Australia has ever seen. What happened after the ship called the Blythe Star disappeared without trace in 1973? Catch Expanse from the Dead on the ABC Listen app. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again on Monday. Thanks for listening.
Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.